Mike, let me start by just asking you to put in the most simple terms you possibly can, what's at stake in Copenhagen? What's at stake in Copenhagen is, you know, nothing short of, you know, a, a conversation between human beings and the basic physics of the planet. It's like uh, a President uh, Mohammed Nasheed of the Maldives said yesterday here in Copenhagen during a, a very passionate and em emotional speech to about 1,500 people in downtown Copenhagen. Uh, you know, he said, we we'd like to negotiate. We'd like to compromise in the in the typical political fashion, uh, but the, the 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 planet's basic physics and biology um, don't compromise in that way. And that we have to get to this level of 350 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by 2100, or we're going to lose the planet upon which human civilization develops. So, I think what's at stake is. The world finally understanding that there is a a number by which we can measure treaty success or failure. Mm -hmm. It's no longer about well, it's good enough. It'll get us through. We'll we'll muddle along. It you know since the ice melt Arctic ice melt season of 2007, when James Hansen and others said we've obviously crossed a trigger point in, in one major ecological system, Arctic ice, and and and. And from that, Hansen and others were able to determine, here's what we believe is the best safety number for, for global warming pollution atmosphere, 350 parts per million. Now we're in Copenhagen trying to negotiate a treaty that gets us toward that number. And and that's what's, I think, what's really at stake. Do we accept as a, as a, as a planet and as all the nations of the planet that we finally have a clear roadmap and we finally have a way to really judge progress. But Mike, the question is not whether people are accepting that, but the speed with which they're prepared to actually do the things necessary to address it. And no um, major proposal, credible proposal that anybody thinks is going to pass that I've seen suggests that, people, that we're going to be able to move fast enough. Am I wrong about that? Well, th there's not only not a pathway, there's there's not a, a commitment to the number yet. Uh, it, it, the, the, the 350 parts per million treaty text mysteriously disappeared over the weekend uh, during, the, during the Copenhagen talks. No one quite knows where it went, who took it out, and then it and then it finally came back on Monday. So it's still in there as a, as a, as a point of official conversation. Um, but we're, you know, we're not, it's not even, it's not even certain that the, the number 350 parts per million, per million is going to survive the so, treaty. So what is your definition of success out of Copenhagen? Well, I don't know what that definition necessarily would be, but I do know I do know that a bad treaty is bad. I mean, a, a yeah, a bad treaty is worse than no treaty at all. I, I think that if we leave Copenhagen um, without an agreement, then we're better than leaving with an agreement that locks us in to 700, 800 parts per million. There's a, there's a, there's an MIT team here that's literally hour by hour taking all the commitments, all the, all the uh, goals being set out by the different nations and plugging them in uh, uh, into a formula that that spits out what the, those various commitments from India, China, and the United States would get us in 2100. And right now, the latest is 770 parts per million CO2. If we take everything that's on the table right now, that's obviously if we get a treaty that locks us into that, we're much better off with gridlock and disagreement and and hope for something better in 2010 than to officially and by by international law committing to that suicide pact. What do you think is the most difficult issue between where we are and the success you want? Is it is it I, is it is it political? Is it economic? Is it is it technical? Uh, I think that the, the the same problem we have now that we had 12 years ago in Kyoto and all the years in between is been that it's basic human denial. Um, you know, we're not necessarily, it, it appears that we're not really well wired as a species to deal with this issue. We're, we've never been really well wired uh, for, for long range horizons. You know, human beings tend to accept a smaller reward now than the promise of a bigger reward later. It's just the way we are, and there's obviously an evolutionary benefit of some kind to that. Um, but you're starting to see that denial melt away in the same way that you're seeing the Arctic ice disappear. Al Gore was here in the Copenhagen 
uh, in, at the Copenhagen talks yesterday and, you know, unveiled some new science from the uh, National uh, Postgraduate Naval Academy uh, that showed that the, that the Arctic could be completely ice-free in the summer by 2014. That denial is starting to, to erode, that human denial, but it's not eroding f as fast as the literal ice is. So we've got to overcome the denial. Look, the technological means to solve this problem are clearly with us. The city of Copenhagen itself, uses, you know, emits one-sixth the per capita carbon emissions as the residents of Washington, D.C. So we can do a better job. I mean, we know how to do a better job with some of these things. We just have to take the best of the best and go do it. It's just getting everybody to do it all at once or fast enough. Al hey, Gore um, says in his new book, Our Choice, that we have enough technological solutions and tools at our means right now to solve three or four climate crises. Okay, so I we only ask, have one to solve. I want to ask you about some very provocative words that you wrote uh, before you went over to uh, Copenhagen. It was an editorial or an op-ed piece that you wrote. And you said, as President Obama soon heads to Copenhagen for global warming talks, there's one simple step Americans back home can take to help out. Stop going green, you wrote. Just stop it. What did you mean? Well, if, if our goal in the United States in the last few years has been to raise awareness about the, the virtue and the importance of going green, of Americans, you know, checking off those 10 things they can do around the house uh, to lower the carbon footprint. If the goal was to raise awareness about what people can do, we, we can check that box. We've succeeded. I mean, you'd have to have been living in a cave the last few years in the United States without have, having heard at least one list of how to go green at the office or at home. We've raised awareness. Um, it's out there. There are green issues of magazines. There's, you can't, you know, it's out there. Um, but are Americans responding? And the, the sad answer is no. Uh, you know, less than 10 percent of the light bulbs in America are energy efficient light bulbs. Only two and a half percent of all auto sales are, are hybrid cars right now. Uh, and 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 there's an easy explanation for that. And that is that, you know, uh, this is a nation of laws. And if we want to change this nation quickly and profoundly, we have to change the laws. And that's always been the case from passing laws that 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 throw the British out of our colonies in the 1700s to changing those laws so the ban slavery go from individual action or individual awareness the to collective and, and national and global action is what you're saying. The best, best, the best thing Americans can do now, I would prefer to have 100,000 Americans phoning their U.S. senator, making green phone calls and sending green emails to the U.S. senator than to have a million Americans doing one tiny thing at their house. But we still see that if you take the list of priorities and the list of most important things, the economy, Iraq, Afghanistan, climate change is still, you know, not in the top five. Well, it is it is it is an issue that has continued to show uh, uh, importance in all, all polling for for a number of years. There was a I think the most recent Washington Post poll shows that 85 percent of Americans believe global warming is happening, and a yeah. very big majority believe the United States should do something about it. Um, so. You know, my nephew is in Iraq, fighting in Iraq. So clearly, my family cares a lot about Iraq. Everybody's hurting from the from the uh, the recession. Uh, everybody's concerned about health care. Um, but this issue of global warming can, continues to mount in human uh, in the American conscience. And and I think one of the best things we can do is admit that we've never solved profound moral and economic issues one house at a time through through volunteerism. But we Americans do support statutes that share the responsibilities and benefits of profound change. And that's what we need with global warming and, and carbon emissions. What do you take away from the Chinese position there? Because so many people are watching the Chinese and the Indians saying these gigantic exploding economies and unless they're a big part of the solution, um, they're going to remain a big part of the problem. Uh, what's your takeaway so far? You know, we finally are all in the same boat. It doesn't matter if we're American, Chinese, Bangladesh, you know, from Bangladesh or the Maldives, we're all going to feel climate boat, change. But we're not all rowing in the same direction quite yet. We're not, but here's the thing. America could get down to zero emissions tomorrow. Yeah. And if the Chinese don't reform their carbon emissions, then the planet is going to bake uh, and vice versa. Right. The, so, the what's, what's, so what struck you most about what the Chinese are all about so far? It, I, 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 I personally think the Chinese have a point that we are historically the United States is more responsible for the climate, you know, carbon emissions than any other country. Thirty percent of what's already up there is ours. Twenty five percent of what's being released now is ours. Um, you, we developed on carbon emissions. China is just now starting to develop. Um, we will look. Here's a final 
gotten a point. The Chinese will never, ever, ever, ever stop burning coal unless we stop burning coal first. We, you know, there's a proposed coal plant just a few hundred miles uh, being built, a new coal plant being built just a few hundred miles from Washington, D.C. Others are being proposed. Um, so, you know, morally, ethically, you can see the Chinese point of view. You know, mathematically, the Chinese have to get involved very, very soon. So I think it's a, it's a, uh, it's a first step sort of thing. Uh, the Chinese uh, want to do as we do, not as we say. And once we start to do as we say, they will follow. Um, last question for you. What's most surprised you uh, of all the positions, speeches, demonstrations, uh, national platforms uh, since you've been in, in, in Copenhagen? I am astonished by the overwhelming media attention being given to the president of a small island nation, the Maldives. You know, President Mohammed Nasheed, uh, Nasheed walks through this conference center followed by a scrum of, of reporters. Why is that? When What's he, going on? He, he has really given a moral voice to the nations that are here in Copenhagen simply asking to survive. They, that, that, they, they want to survive. I mean, the Maldives will disappear completely. It's not an unreasonable request that they be allowed to survive. And, and, and the president of the Maldives, Mohammed Nasheed, keeps coming back to this number 350. 350 means safety. It, 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 it's survival for all of us, but in particular for these, for these most vulnerable nations. And it, the media are really, really covering his every move here. Um, he gave a speech last night in downtown Copenhagen. I counted 24 TV cameras uh, for a president that no one had ever heard of uh, just six months ago. And it's because he's raised his voice about survival and about this number, 350, as a challenge to everyone. This is a president who two years ago was in prison and was tortured by the dict dictator government of the Maldives. And he said last night, he said, there were times when I was in prison and the government, the dictator government told me, give up. We have the power. We have the guns. We have the army. You have no hope of succeeding. Give up your campaign for democracy. And he didn't. And he overcame and he became two years ago the first democratically elected president of the Maldives. And now he says we have to do the same with climate change. It looks hard. It looks dark. It's it's a an overwhelming task. But can we give up? How, what right do we have to give up when others have come before us and done so much in different different moral campaigns around the world? And that's what's really impressed me because people are responding to the voice of an a previously obscure uh, leader of a small nation and, it, and it's resonating and it's working. Hey, Mike, thanks a lot. I appreciate your time. Good luck with what's uh, with what's left there. We'll, maybe we'll talk to you when you're back. Love to, love to hear your take on it when it's all over. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you all taking the time to uh, to do this fascinating uh, interview with this fascinating technology. And this fascinating guy. So I appreciate <laughs> that, too. Thank you. T take it easy. Bye-bye.